I'm Rod Grimes. I'm here to talk about some improvements in ZFS performance uh, with respect to send and file receives. Um, some issues that we found um, with different techniques of sending file systems back and forth. A uh, little bit about who I am. I'm one of the original FreeBSD founders. I started with uh, Patch Kit and William Jolitz in, in 386 BSD in 1992. Um, I've been working with Unix on and off since the early 80s. I think Dan got a clicker for me, didn't he? So I don't have to. Yep. We're going to talk about three major different pieces here. We're going to talk a little bit about encryption and why encryption slows down this operation. We're going to talk about pipes and why pipes slow it down. And we're going to talk a little bit about a new way to get around all of that, which is uh, a very simple option. I'm actually almost embarrassed at how simple this was to do. It's, uh, each time when you're using a, a ZFS send pipe to a ZFS receive, one of the big overheads that you're going to run into is context switching, and that's becoming more expensive now that we have Meltdown and Spectre to interfere with us. The um, CPU load at high network speeds becomes pretty pretty intense with all of the context switching going on. You basically have to copy data out of the user land. Or, well, if you start on the send side, you copy it out of the ZFS file system, out to user land, through a binary that sends it to a pipe, that sends it back into the kernel to a ZFS receive. And that's if you're doing local um, ZFS sends and receives. It's highly affected by the size of these buffers that are used to copy that data into and out of. Um, I'm not going to, there's not going to be a whole bunch of benchmark data and numbers and fancy graphs and that to look at. It's very machine dependent um, and that you can produce all sorts of different numbers and, and the numbers can only tell you some basic things about, about what's going on. The ancient buffer size for pipes was 512 bytes because in the early days, all they were doing was they were piping little bits of text between document formatters in the publisher's workbench. And, and performance, it, it, was, it was more important because they were working in 64 kilobyte address spaces that they didn't eat it all up with a whole bunch of buffers. Um, machine sizes grew, buffer sizes went up a little bit, and we got some 4K buffer sizes. But it was still a static size allocation. Um, that eventually involved into a dynamically growable pipe buffer size to, again, improve performance as machining grooves. We got a VM system. It gave us the ability to have lots of address space. The amount of buffers we had didn't become as much of a, of a concern. Um, there's still a pool that kind of caps you at how many of these you can get. You can actually do too much piping and end up in an Eno buff condition. If you've got a whole lot of stuff on your machine running pipe code that um, can affect you. The later implementation, what we have now, is you can actually increase dynamically in size and shrink that size depending upon load. There's, there's like four tiers of, of uh, pool usage. If you're in the bottom tier where you're only using 25% of the whole pool space, your initial allocation will be like a 16K pipe buffer, and that will grow to an upper limit. These, um, I believe the upper limit and lower limit are both tunable. I know the upper limit, there's, you can change how big the pipe buffer will grow. If you, you start getting lots of pipes running so that you're using up your pool and get into the, the 25 to 50% range, your initial allocation will get will become 4K, so that, that it has a better chance. If you get into the 75 to 100% pool range usage, it will actually try and shrink back the amount of buffer space the pipe's using. So there's some reclaiming going on. This code is pretty hard to get Eno you know, buffs out of, and lets you get to the point where you've got so many pipes that the 4K buffers will eat up all of your pool. If you've got a really large server with a lot of cores on it doing a lot of piping code, you could get there. It doesn't happen very often in the pipe situation. Um, this current pipe code has been benchmarked and tested, and it, its performance 
is heavily dependent upon the size of your L1, L2, and L3 caches. You basically, you'll see three spikes in your performance curves that are the performance as long as you're smaller than an L1 cache, performance as long as you're smaller than the L2, performance as long as you're smaller than L3, and then it falls off to memory bandwidth. Um, the current code doesn't care. It doesn't even look at that. Um, and it doesn't have any considerations about NUMA, which means if, I, if you're piping between two cores that are talking to the same L1 cache, if you can keep that data in the L1 cache, it's a performance benefit. Pipe code doesn't know anything about that. It's, that would, uh, the current pipe code for doing the copy in and copy out operations, um, use a single mutex and a lock. It's, the lock is a flag, or there's a, there's a mutex protecting a flag. And so it's very hard to get any concurrency in this pipe code. It uh, basically, as soon as, you write, as soon as you write enough up to a point, you block until the reader gets done draining, draining some buffer space back for you. Um, it's not double buffered, and it's, it's implemented using UI, UIO move, which means you're not even page flipping between user land and kernel. So UIO move may have the, the ability to detect page line, page size buffers. Um, I think that's what I just covered. Uh, Dragonfly, uh, Matt Dillon wrote some new code um, where he took the pipe code, he made two buffers, um, it added a couple of locks so that we're no longer using a single lock so that you can actually get some, some concurrency here. I think his claim was like about a 30% performance improvement in pipe code. Um, I think we should probably look closer at that. I looked at it quickly and it was fairly, it's, once you get rid of all the variable naming changes and, and stuff, the actual fundamental function change is pretty simple. It's, it's not really complicated. And it would probably be good to take a closer look at that and look for other places that may have done some work in this area. Because our, our pipe code is, is very untouched. It, hasn't, it has not been altered a lot for probably 15 years, I think was the last time much work was done there. Um, on to the next phases of things that slow ZFS down. And I'm going way too fast. Are there any questions at this point? If you guys got something, throw a hand up, interject. If, if we got lots of time. This talk is really short. The um, encryption can become a bottleneck. It depends on what's, what's bottlenecking your ZFS. I can't do anything about it if you're disbanded. I guess disbound. Um, I was just talking with, with Dan, and evidently he moved like 28 terabytes in 10 hours across his servers the other night, last night. And it's like, yeah, Alan, want, Alan wants to try it. Let's, let's try it and see what it'll do if it'll increase performance. More than likely, he was in a disk-bound disc situation. So freeing up CPU resources, freeing up memory sources, resources and stuff are not going to help that move. It, may, it will reduce the CPU load on the machine. Um, he wasn't piping over SSH because it was a local. If, if you start piping uh, ZFS sends across a, a secure shell, you're now encrypting all of your data. So you're getting um, a significant CPU load on both ends because you're going to encrypt it and decrypt it. There are at least two different SSH packages out there that have been hacked that do, I think one of them gets rid of the, you still, you still do secure stuff during the authentication. You set up both ends of it with secure key passing and everything. But once that's done, you're passing clear text data across the wire. And it, that's, that's a good solution, if, especially if, you, if you're shoving lots of data around in a data center that doesn't need to be secured, it's, it's beneficial. But the SSH folks don't like that idea. Huh? In kernel That would be one way to do it? Yeah. Uh, comment? No? Okay. <laughs> it, it would fit very well with what you're going to talk about 
Yeah, later. What the end kernel TLS comes up as a, as a solution to, to something that I've totally ignored. And there's a slide about that later. And the, you'll notice that, that the, another way to do it is, is to use Netcat. Just throw SSH out the door if you, don't, if you don't need any form of authentication on either end of it. The downside to using Netcat is you end up with it shouldn't say two pipes you you well you do end up with two pipes because you got it you've got a a netcat running on each machine that's passing the data back through a pipe the, the send side is piping it out to netcat and the receive side is piping it in from a netcat so you're going kernel user land pipe into a socket across the network which may be loop back back out of the network stack to user land through a pipe and back into the kernel. So you make that copy and copy out transition twice. So this is actually a bad solution. Um, you go one direction four times. You go in and out twice. So, yeah, it, and that adds up. Those are, that's significant CPU load when you're trying to, if you're trying to push data across 10 gigabit and you have SSDs, that can really load a machine down very quickly because it's it's um, not a, not a pretty scenario. So how do we get rid of that problem? All of those problems. We quit using pipes. Simply use a socket to connect ZFS send to ZFS receive. And is what we do is instead of using the the the, the uh, the, a pipe out to standard out and a pipe in from standard in. The code, the in kernel ZFS code actually just wants a file descriptor. It only, it, 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 that's all it cares about. And to it, a pipe looks the same as a socket does. It could care less. Um, this eliminates all of the user land code all of the copy in, all of the copy out, all of the buffering that occurs due to that copy in and copy out. So what did it take to do this? And this is the horribly embarrassing part. You simply add a git op processing to process those dash s's. Add a little bit of code to connect to a socket and simply literally use the exact same ZFS calls into the kernel that already existed to pass that socket into the kernel in its place. You eliminate all of the context switches, all the copy ins and copies out from the kernels. You don't need any more locking of these buffers in the pipe code. So what you end up with is the in kernel ZFS buffers are getting passed to a write call that the socket code very politely for you breaks up into a bunch of MBUFs and sends it to your NIC. And if you've got LR, uh, TCP offload engines in place and stuff, it doesn't even have to do the breakups for you. Um, the, uh, the other end of it is, is a read directly from MBUF code, which will probably be chained MBUFs, into, a, into, a, into the ZFS. And so it, it really, really eliminates a lot of stuff. You, you kill a couple processes in that the ZFS send and the ZFS receive on each end are basically sitting in a blocked state. They're not doing anything. If, if you look at CPU usage to try and figure out how much the pipe code is using on each end, you can actually see it at, at above gigabit speed. You can see a pretty significant user land CPU usage in these sends and receives. If you use the sockets, ZFS send and receive are zero. They don't, I mean, it's, it's nothing at all. It took 177 lines of code. When, I, when, when Al, Alan's the one that this comes from, I owe, I owe a, a great thanks to Scale Engine to bringing the problem to me. Um, he, was, he was trying to fix the pipe code, which we both kind of agreed is pretty broken. Um, I looked at it real quickly and decided that sockets would probably work better here. And, and I thought I was going to have to go into the ZFS kernel code and add socket implementation in there. When I found, I, when I found out they were passing an FD to the kernel, I was like, oh, this is going to be too simple. You've got to be kidding me. 
Um, it's not there yet because I can't push it from here because I forgot my FreeBSD key. <laughs> Though Peter might be able to fix that for me. He can probably push it to there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> there needs to be some future works done. Um, the pipes and the cache sizing code, or the size of pipes based upon cache sizes, I think would probably be a good improvement to look at. Um, right, right now, we're just. We're, we're, well, not only the default max size, I'm actually concerned about the, the default startup size being 16K for the normal case, where you don't have heavy machine load and the pool isn't, the, the pipe pool is not under. Um, load. The 16K startup is, is fine for all of our L1 caches. That'll fit real easy. Right. And, did, and the, the dynamic adjustment starts at 16K and then it goes up if the sizes of the chunks you're sending into the pipe are large. Are large enough. But if they're too large, then it doesn't quite do the right thing. Yeah. And th you get, th being aware that you probably want to actually start with half of L1 because half, half, half of an L1 cache is a common. That way you don't starve the data cache out for anything that's going to happen during the context switch of the pipe operation. You leave some, some associative cache space in L1 for the other bits to go on. If you, start, if you start using all of caches, you're going to push other stuff out of cache, and that can be a performance hit. Because then if, if basically you cache thrash back and forth, in, in, if I use all of up to L3, I've completely de depleted a core, or actually a whole socket, of cache space while I was copying the buffer. So what's going to happen is instead of on the receiving side of that pipe, instead of it still being in L3 cache, I'm going to push some bits out doing the context switch between the sender and the receiver. And that's not a real good scenario. Um, so the page flipping pipe. That's actually Matt Dillon's double buffer thing that right. we should do. Well, a page should fit in L1. And usually, Matt, I think, actually initially uses two pages on each side. So it's, so it's only, it's, you can actually fit, it's, it's four pages. So that's 16 K bytes. So it all fits already in everybody's L1 cache. So it's, when, yeah, my bigger concerns is when we push past the L1 cache size and start deciding that we're going to allocate bigger buffers. And there's a good use for it, but I don't want it. I think we should, you, it's a use case. It's a machine load case. It's not a simple thing to deal with. It's actually pretty complicated because you get, you get into cache topologies, you get into NUMA. Are these pipes even, are, are both sides of the pipes even running in the same socket? Um, because then you get, you get socket thrashing of caches where, where the, you have to um, deal with those problems. But the... I would like to see the upper limit become not a single limit and probably become a couple of thresholds and adjust those thresholds based upon the sizes of L2 and L3. If you have, if there is no cache contention, give pipe L3. If, if you've got one pipe in the machine shoving a massive amount of data back and forth, your best performance is if you give it all of L3. Um, that's why micro benchmarks that try to benchmark the pipe code that just copy large amounts of data across the pipe will always tell you that your optimum performance comes up to about L3. You'll be, you'll be really, f if you're moving small amounts of data, you'll be really, really fast at each cache size. If you're moving more than L3 amount of data, the benchmark will always tell you that performance goes up to L3 size and then goes flat. Doesn't matter how big you make the buffer after size of L3, you're doing IO to memory. Um, if you do, probably the sweet spot, but you probably had other. That's there was, there's multimodal. huh? There was multimodal. Yeah, yeah. Which is what what commonly happens. 
If you run 16 copies of that at the same time, more interesting things start happening. Assume you were on, an, on a 16-thread um, eight-core so that you have, you're using hyper-threading and stuff. You'll see some really weird stuff start happening when you get above cache sizes because now you're, you're, put, you're contending for the cache. And so you won't, you'll still see modal stuff, but it won't be at half of cache size because now you've got eight people competing for that same cache space. And yes? Exactly. You, you, want to, you want to do processor affinity and, and, and numa locate each side of a pipe if you can, and you want to then figure out what the cache sizes are between the, those, those numa proximal processes. And when you write and block, because you've filled the buffer up, you want to be able to tell the scheduler that it's the other side of the pipe that should use the rest of my time slice. You're yielding. You're yielding, so. So, uh, as someone who's not that familiar with the code base, does FreeBSD at all support NUMA in some kind of fashion? Like in the yes. Huh? The page allocation is NUMA aware. Yes. It's, it's actually, no, most of, most of Jeff's work's been merged. Um, uh, phase one is in work, is merged. Phase two. Two, is yeah, okay. Right yeah. Um, there, there is a uh, set CPU. Is that the? Good. And what is the model of the kernel right now? So the CPU topology, also the cache topology explicitly modeled, or is it confused? I don't remember cache topology is modeled or how well it's modeled, but we're, uh, I, we have to talk to Jeff. Yeah, yeah, we would need Jeff on those things. I, I interacted with Jeff on some other issues that have to do with Beehive, and basically the status that he gave me of where Numa was and stuff is, is wait. <laughs> Before before going down a lot of rabbit holes, so it. The, the intention is to model all the way through, um, you know, like four or five different layers of, of, of topology groupings based on like right. how AMD and Powder yeah. really do their their cache affinity. Uh, but I don't remember if it's all there yet or not. Well, I, yeah, on other architectures, I've got no idea where what he's capable of in those areas. But I had a point that Um, this actually came up three days ago. Somebody that I was talking to about some of this pipe code mentioned that we don't have any K event KQ support at all in the pipe. So, and there evidently are, are some use cases. There's, I think it was Brian Drury, um, that would be nice because the, he has some Podre build stuff, I believe, that would uses a huge number of pipes, and um, being able to pull it off with K event KQ would would be of a benefit to him. And so I threw that into the slide. This came up earlier where we talked about SSH encryption and just turn the security stuff off. Somebody mentioned TLS as a transport layer. This change does not have any security concerned or security mechanisms in it whatsoever. This is a raw socket. When you say ZFS receive dash socket and give it, give it an IP and a port, it opens that socket and listens. And that's all it does. So if you're not behind a firewall or have other mechanisms to protect it in place, this can be an unsecure tool. But I don't believe we should put security policy into this. I think that belongs externally. You can do it with TLS. You can, you can just say, okay, this socket's going to be, you can do IP, the way I did it was with IPFW. You can really easily protect the port with IPFW. Um, in the local case where you're talking over loopback, it doesn't matter at all, and that's actually one of the, the, the higher speed use cases for it. Yeah.
That's a, I don't fork. He, he wants the FD still open after I get done because I need to. I need to. I need to close it to finish the sand. Either one. He had, Mm -hmm. Started setting up internal printers. Then it forks XX, but on XX from that socket that I already prepared and forked you just, for you is not closed. And I pass the DSS library, which I, this is a very common pattern on Linux. I don't say it's particularly nice, but it's I, why you need to pass the bus to the computer. Put it in standard and so you, you, you do, yeah, you don't even need to use this. If you, if you have a file descriptor, well, no. But when he calls the ZFS command, it's going to end up gluing his socket to the other side of a pipe. No, no, it's not. Uh, I think... If he actually, actually, you could, if you altered standard in and standard out and called ZFS, it would just work. Okay. Well, you don't even need to do that. Yeah. yeah, you don't even, you, you could do that before this patch. Yeah. So Go ahead. Um, given the security concerns, especially on the receiving side, yeah. like in, in what scenarios do you see this being safe to use? Loop back for one. Sure. <laughs> okay. In a, lo in a local data center that's, administ that's administratively controlled, Server farms, that kind of stuff, where you're behind, where it's where it's administrative turn, where 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 you. There's not a lot of other examples of even within a server farm where you can open a port and then somebody can send stuff on that and panic your system or corrupt your data. I don't know if you can well, if panic you your kernel. That would. I guarantee you can panic. I guarantee you can panic your kernel, and you can probably like arbitrarily. Okay. So, <laughs> this is something you didn't even benefit from seeing this thing on a port all day, really. But, yeah. Uh, maybe by accident, but yeah. 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 There are. I just, I haven't, I haven't addressed them. Some of the. Uh, I don't know that there are equivalent security risks that we could say, well, well, if you're already doing X, then this is no worse. Correct. So I think it's hard, it's it, hard to reason about, like, when, like, if you're trying to convince somebody, hey, you should use this functionality in your enterprise. Right, and th there have been other implementations. I, I spoke with somebody at who was it? Was it Isilon? Somebody actually implemented a similar situation. Only they went the extra mile of of, of supporting a. Um, I'm trying to think of what they did. I think they added TLS support to the command line tool. Yes. The, the, the reason the, the reason I left security concerns or considerations out of this is there are lots of ways to address those security concerns, and I didn't want to cloud the, what is. I, I, I'm very fine with that. Again, the purpose of this is to be able to configure the rest of the network. Yeah, you, you have uh, alternatives with IPsec. You have alternatives with IP firewall or any of the firewalling code to be able to protect the sockets on the other end. Um, you're, it's not like you're leaving. A, you, you don't have to necessarily leave a socket listening, listening for a long time because it's completely valid to. It, it's you have to backwards think things a little bit, but you can actually SSH to the remote end that starts the listening socket up and then execute the send. So your your open window is very narrow, but it exists. It's not zero. I'll agree. There's. There's no window. You're saying, like, I want to do this, and I have the, and I have the authority to do it on the target system. Um, it, it, I wonder if there's some easy way to be able to get that same, like, when I do, like, I'm running the ZFS receive, but I just want to make sure that the input to the ZFS receive is what I want it to be, as opposed to opening a port and letting anybody connect to it and dump whatever they want in there. I, I actually. So, like, having some, like, authentication here, that's the end of the end stream or something like that. 
Okay, my first, hang on back. The, my first idea that when the security thing kind of came up was, well, I can just copy what Netcat does and I can say, l l only accept, on the receive side, I could enhance the yes option to say that not only do I have a, um, actually, you know what, it's not as bad as you think it is because the receive side, the dash S, gives the IP and port See, to, to receive that it's, li it's listening on, but I could, to that, add what the IP and port of the sender is, so he's the only one that could okay. connect to it. Huh? So you're saying that you only accept connections from the... That, that IP, right. which is, that basically, that puts, um, what's the old tool that we used to wrap socket, TCP wrappers, that basically gives you TCP wrappers built into, it, yeah, it just, it, it says who, who you can receive from. That would actually be really, really easy to, to change. I mean, look, we have huh? Like, the sender, you don't have to flip it. Actually, that's a good idea. Reversing the code would, would be a improvement in a secure situation, and it's really trivial to do because it's just it's just whether receive does listen and and send just make it send do the listen and, and I, I, I BAP was has so been that, that is a problem in my first job uh, and uh, what we ended up with uh, was having something behind INFB for the receive part so uh, on the send part was I wanted something there there having some negotiation so that I can pass where I want to receive uh, so I had the arguments for the receive and then once it's done uh, I don't have to uh, call the You, you, you should be able to call this from my net D. Uh, yes, yeah, exactly. You have to specify what file system you want to receive it into. Yeah. 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 So you well, you didn't say it would be easy. <laughs> And it, there are so many different ways to solve the security issue, but I think the first order of business is I'll just I'll reverse the, the send and receive. If you're aiming to replace the NetCat model of usage, NetCat does exactly what Alan just described. Oh, it is backwards. It, well, it, sorry, it can do exactly what Alan just described. Okay. I guess we're, we're already here well into it. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, my concern is that I appreciate that like, there's a lot of different ways that you can secure it, but if you're saying, like, I want to put this into ZFS, and I want, oh, like, I, as you're saying, like, I want to make it so that ZFS makes it very easy for people to open enormous security holes, and yeah, you can, <laughs> like, there's 10 different ways you can secure it, but, like, by default, if you just run ZFS, like, it is not secure, then, like, that's my concern. So, like, saying, I'll like, agree. You, know, you can layer mm -hmm. X on top of it to get security, is, is not really an answer to my concern where you're saying, I want to put it into, you know, ZFS upstream by default. Yeah, and, the, and those, those issues haven't been addressed yet, though I have talked to some of the people at ZFS. If I can say something, I sure. think if any security should be in this, it should be the simplest one, because if you go with encryption, you will have to have security one day. Why not just use existing tools? This is why I was saying IPsec. I, But we do need to, I haven't at this point, I didn't say I wasn't going to address security concerns, because there are some, and we're aware of that. And I just, it, it's, right now, it's usable code that a few people use. I, actually, I don't even know if anybody's using it outside of me. But it's been given to a few people. Okay, that, cut, that, that, that cuts the 177 lines down to about 12. <laughs> and I'm even more embarrassed, because <laughs> this is actually a really good idea. 
here's my FD. Well, you, you don't, you, you actually don't even need the ZFS command at that point. It's, it's just a system call. It's just a call. It's an ioctal. Right. Yeah. The, the, this page flipping pipe idea and stuff came from last year here. Um, me and Tico Nightingale sat down and, and looked at the pipe code um, because we were told it was doing things that we didn't think it was doing, that it, it was actually doing page flipping um, in the kernel. And we went through and looked at it and stuff to try and figure out exactly what was implemented and found that it wasn't. And then we discussed, well, how can we make it do that? Um, and it comes up against some policy problems. I, we, we can make it do it, but it alters slightly the semantics of pipe in that when you do a write to a pipe and the pipe returns, you still have the same buffer. So your contents of that buffer is still the same. If I want to do page flipping between two different processes of a common kernel buffer, the, the pages need to be page sized or multiples of page size. They need to be page aligned. And after you get done with write, what was in your page isn't going to be there anymore because you got flipped to the other side of the pipe. You're going to get, it, it's not a data exposure because you're going to get prior data back. So it's not a problem rotating the pages, but it completely eliminates the copy operations. And basically it's pipe NG. It would, it would, it's, would, probably have identical or near identical calling conventions. It just would no longer guarantee that your buffer was untouched when you, when you came back from the kernel. And, and that basically does the VM splice that you're talking about. That gives, you, that gives you FDs between two different processes that are communicating over page flipped or shared memory. They, 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 need, they need to do special allocation of the buffers because they have to, they have to allocate page aligned, page size buffers. And that's really the biggest change the program makes. They can't just malloc a buffer. And it, it needs to be kernel friendly. Any more questions? Other than you have no way to, to, oh, it has an exec, so it can exec the, uh, exactly. 
might be able to implement it that way. That's basically what it's doing. Okay. The ZFS code just opens standard in and standard out. So yes, if NCAT can exec ZFS and pass it a arbitrary socket that's open on standard in and standard out, that would work because that's all this code does. It's Yeah, and MC can't do this. It's yeah, it's, and it's simple to use. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You're. Cr it doesn't block the kernel. It doesn't. You're. You're just. You once. Once you do the ioctal and pass the socket into the kernel and it starts writing stuff, you're still an interruptible process. It's just you're running in kernel all the time. You have no reason you have no reason to go back to user land for a long, long time. And then on the operational point in particular if I want to add the tools around that, uh, would be nice to get some kind of progress information back. Yeah. With with dash V? No, I have not. Mm, how does it get that information back out? Because this. Oh, it's a separate thread. Okay, that's why. Okay. The, one of the, one of the reasons that you do want to use the ZFS is because of things like there's this separate thread thing. You can't. It's not that easy just to open an FD and pass it into ZFS for a send operation. There are some other consideration setups. You got to get a pool handle, and then you got to get a data set handle, and there's a whole bunch of consistency checks that goes on. Um, and I, I was wading through all of that, and when I I was like, okay, can I can I really just take this FD and change what it points to and not break anything anywhere else? And I couldn't. The F, the Literally, it is hard coded as a define in ZFS that's this standard out and standard in. They got different names on them, but um, and so it was. It was. It was one of those. I just changed the define for it, and the other one, it was. It was actually in the call to the ioctal, and I just I had to create a variable and do the open and make the FD. Go ahead. Oh yeah, absolutely. As long as we got time, we'll keep talking about it. So, it's, um, I want feedback. That's what the, what that's. If you, what if you did something like we keep the existing what you have so far, mm -hmm. um, where the receiver opens the you know opens the port, but um, when you do the ZFS receive, it outputs a random number, and it says basically I, I will receive whatever you throw at me on this port, but first you have to start by sending me this random number, which I'm telling you. And then when you do the send, you. You do like ZFS send, I want to send it out onto this port and start by sending this random number, which I'm applying to you on the I, it, it, right. And then so then when the send goes, it, it's sending the sending the you know the basically shared secret to the receiver and the receiver says, aha, uh -huh, somebody must have gotten my snared output, send it and, and then they got it to the sending side, so I know that it's you, I know it's you who's trying who is trying to do this that's actually giving me the input. Rather than like some random person on the internet or on your network I'm, I'm, that's I'm, in there. I'm stringing the one liner together in my head, and I think that you could actually SSH to the remote end, starting the ZFS receive up that output the key inside of a subshell that was that was back ticked to the ZFS send dash key equal that the, uh, of that. With the send options, yeah, that would probably work pretty simply, and it's not very intrusive. the bi The biggest thing is, is I need to go talk to the Open ZFS folks. Any of them here? <laughs> Other than you, that that what would it take to try and move forward? With? This code is so portable that you could probably take my diff and apply it and run it on Linux, you know, or even maybe the Windows copy, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Because I don't know if the ZFS command itself is extensively different there. You may know what what they. Uh, yeah. So, it, 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 and I want to go down that road. This is a proof of con concept. First presentation. Get feedback to is. It, 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 we know it's usable. 
but how much more do we have to do to it to make people okay with it and, and feel warm about using it? Um, And and you're, yeah, and 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 you're 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 doing, you're you're doing you're doing four buffer copies and and two extra processes and you're probably running local so ten gig, <laughs> and that it kills at ten gig when you when you do what he just described if if you have fast drives. Yes. Try forty and hundred. Huh? Try forty gig and hundred with a little bit. Even, yeah, you, you could probably, if you had SSDs and a... Well, no, when you have 30 gigs or 72 disks in the machine. <laughs> okay, yeah, there's ways to get the bandwidth on that side of it. You never gave me the numbers back. Oh, yeah, that little short one burst test, yeah, it was, it, it, and is what I didn't get back from you that I really wanted was what did it do to the CPU load during that transition? Right, it's in, it, yeah, you have to measure, you, yeah, you, you have to be able to measure uh, kernel cycles. Go ahead. The, the random key is coming back yeah, backwards. Yeah, for sure. This no, because he can own you. I'm trying to check a random person, like, I'm not even a man in the middle, right? Like, with this proposal, I'm yes. not going to be a man in the middle. I just have to be on your network. Like, as long you don't as have to be on my network. <laughs> I think something we missed there is that they're not pre-pending the key. It's the key is an out-of-band. It's an out-of-band token that's sent back. The, the out of the, the, I think part of what's missing is the out-of-bound token the backwards path to the sender is over SSH, so a man in the middle can't see those. But, right, you're right but that the, during, when they're actually sending it, yeah. they just the forward. Yeah. Yeah. But 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 the key the key is sent after the socket's connected. Yeah. Right. If you don't send the right key initially, right. I can steal the key and what good does the key do you? Well, if you're in the middle, you're owned anyway. It, it, yeah, if you're going to change after it. it. Well, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's IPsec, and there are other, and that's the way to do it. And you've just added the encryption layer back in that I got rid of. But, but it's in a better place. It's it's better place in in kernel IPsec doing encryption, and that's what the, the vendor I talked to that had Im, uh, implemented this. Um, in, in their appliance, um, did did so with a TLS or IPsec capability and pushed the token in from user land, and they went, yeah, it was really invasive, because once once you do that, it's no longer just an FD you have to pass into the kernel. You now have got to pass key to, keys, um, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, and and believe it or not. The vendor was okay with, with the idea that we weren't, I wasn't pushing to implement strong security in this. He goes, they were, yeah, we see the use for it, we know about it, it just, for us it wasn't, it was, we went ahead and bit the bullet. They're looking at, well, do we continue to bite the bullet? Because as they have, they now have this local private change they have to lug around. And that can be, we all know what a nightmare that can be. Go ahead. A lot of people do.
They have to come to me to get a private key to turn the S option on. <laughs> yeah, but like, why did I write the code? I mean, I'm like, why didn't I know about that solution? I didn't ever, th I didn't even think about just using an external tool to pass. I could have given the same talk. You said use NCAT. Eliminated 177 lines of development. Those are versions from NMAP, by the way. Huh? Those are versions from NMAP.org. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yes? Maybe if we just got to start communicating clearly that we're giving random stuff, then. Yeah. Well, I think there, it, it can't be completely random. You actually have to talk ZFS to the socket or it's going to go. Uh. If, if your packets don't look right. No, it, we should probably make them aware of that. Yeah. that, that but at least, at least when they're today, when they're running ZFSCC, they're running ZFSCC, right? right? Versus like basically saying, I'm running a ZFSCC, then like anybody on my network can throw stuff in there. It's like that's a very larger. Well, they, they, that's that's occurring now. P, I mean, Peter gave a perfect example. The whole bunch of us run around throwing netcats in front of ZFS send and ZFS receives, and that puts you exactly in the boat this does. It's just my boat's faster. <laughs> so okay, you can damage more data sets quicker or own more machines quicker. It's still the, it's still the same set of problems. I don't I don't see it adding a huge security hole that doesn't already isn't already occurring. And, and that we should address that. And I think at least by possibly by putting this into the command, we could also put into the command that the fact that we, we've reversed these things so that you can't, you don't have just an opening socket listening there without knowing where it's coming from. Possibly add the, the ability to um, document that you should probably protect yourself with IPsec or TLS or some other layer before using this option. But ZFSN doesn't say to do any of that stuff, but it can't get off the box on its own. On its own. But you, you also, it, it, it's not documented that you probably shouldn't go off the box on your own with NC. So. You need to what? The, the previous ZFS man pages are, have no ancestry to the OpenZFS ones anymore. Did they ever come from ZFS? Yes, but then Martin Nasuska rewrote them all in Mandoc. And it's, yeah, it's in Mandoc. Yeah. And then they upstream, <coughs> and now they're you, and, and so you have a ZFS man page that's quite different than what we have, hopefully in better shape. Because our, our, our ZFS man page is horrible. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> not much different than my Huh? Oh. Well, well I, that was because, see, I have to do a man page change to do this, and that isn't yeah. done yet. And even I, w I went and looked and went, nah. <laughs> I don't want to do this. But um, anything else? Because I, I don't know how. I stretched it past time. Is it lunchtime? Yes, it's lunchtime, isn't it? What do I got? Do I got a... Thank you. That's where you can find me at.